Hello everybody, it's Grace. Welcome to Eating Peace this week. I'm getting excited because it's only one month until the annual Eating Peace retreat. And there's a couple of spots left, so I want to share a little bit about it. And it's what our exercise is today. So even if you never come to a retreat, that's okay. One important and powerful thing that's developed over time as I offer this retreat is that you choose your own food. Now for some people, that scares them half to death. I can't choose my own food. I don't know what to eat. I do it wrong. Or maybe they have an idea that this is what it looks like if publicly you choose food and this is what it should look like if you're really normal and healthy and doing food perfectly. You know, you've got your protein and vegetables, right? Never any sugar, never any of this kind of thing, never any packaged foods. And I'm not saying you should have those because I hardly ever eat them. I just notice. But they aren't the, an evil an evil empire of the world either. <laughs> um, so I don't have to be afraid of them. So we do spend some time looking at the safety and the experience of choosing food and buying it with your eyes, being in a store, acquiring it, going to a restaurant, going ahead and cooking and getting groceries, and assembling food after you've acquired it and whether you've cooked it yourself or whatever it is you're, whatever it is you're getting, and then placing it before you and then noticing that the body or what you wish to eat as you really touch base with your body and let your body feel what is necessary and your body lead the way, that we never do that. We get that so drilled out of us that dieting and eating and food and plans becomes all a part of the mind. It's like something to organize like a project manager with the mind overwriting our emotions, emotional life, if you've emotionally eaten. So it becomes like there's this incredible amount of tension placed on, all, on, on the food and managing it and organizing it and deciding what you're eating, not that there's anything wrong ever with any of that because you can really do the practice and experiment and find what works for you. Some people find incredible relief at just having some kind of structure. But in the retreat, because we're all sharing and together and kind of vulnerable and out in the open, but supportive and kind and practicing kindness, once the food is in front of you and you're experiencing a relationship with this food and eating, you touch base with your body, your body becomes the thing that is leading the way. And you can trust your body once you get your mind settled down a little. Mind gets so scared especially with all the messages about what you should or should not be eating at all times, you know, um, and watch out and warning and alarm, alarm. So when we're not operating with all the fears we've had about food and eating, it becomes possible to really be in touch with the body and the sense of the body and our hunger, which you can look up a hunger scale. I've done videos with hunger scale, just feeling hunger in the body and stopping at a satisfied seven. Satisfied seven. Tan being stuffed to the gizzard, which is stopping at satisfied seven. And like giving it time to feel and see and wonder about that and experience it. And then also not letting ourselves get hunger, hungry below a three. And I know these numbers are even in the mind, but it becomes a sense as you practice Everyone has, asked, uh, has access to this. There becomes a sense in the body you can feel. Even if you've been a binger, an emotional eater, you know why this is uncomfortable. is because your body is saying no. And just to trust and let the body lead the way. And all the thoughts that we have about, I can't wait. You know, the body is too slow. Mind is so much faster than the body. You know, emotions move, right, quickly but just to let the body lead the way and that you won't go hungry and it's okay to have that be slower. You start even liking it be slower. So we do that in the retreat where you get to choose and you might notice that you've selected far more foods than you can eat in one meal, which is totally okay. Great to discover. Food is still there. You can wait and hold on to it till later or not. It's all okay. 
no wrong way to do it. Just the practice of being with this body, eating what you're eating, and I guide people every step of the way. That's what's really fun and interesting. So you don't have to worry or wonder or not trust yourself or be in the state of um, just to total despair because you don't know what to eat, don't know when to stop, don't know how to start again, you know, have lost touch with your body. We're just getting back in touch with the body. So I wanted to mention that and I myself am about to go on a retreat right now also teaching a retreat and this is just a general retreat in the work. We're going to Brighton Bush Hot Springs Conference Center. It's in deep in the Oregon Cascade Mountains and it's going to be very cold and very beautiful. And it's a full retreat, very excited. And I remember a day when if I was going off to a place that was new, where they would be cooking for me, I would be a little anxious. They're cooking for me. I'm gonna have three meals a day where we're sitting down and you have to have enough to eat in that moment and the right kinds of foods and I wonder what they're gonna serve and maybe I should better, better take some snacks for in between just a lot of anxiety. So what I thought I would share with you today, you know, since we're speaking about retreats and going someplace that is not home, you know, being off someplace, connecting with others, someplace unusual, is to be able to wonder with inquiry. I will not be able to manage this. I need lots of extra help. Something could terrible could go wrong with my food and eating. Um, I won't have support. I remember talking to a dear, dear friend once who is a certified facilitator also of the work of Byron Katie. So he's done a lot of, of practicing in the work. He assisted, with, his name's Todd, and he assisted with me last summer also at a, at a retreat at Brighton Bush. And he was sharing with me once that he went on a long retreat and at this retreat, they did not have vegetarian options. Now, at Brighton Bush, it's all vegetarian. Sometimes people freak out like, I need more protein. You can almost ask, is that true? Well, you can also bring it if you need it. But, um, and of course, we all know, we all know how to work with that. Getting your own needs met if you have special, a special diet. But he was a vegetarian and had been most of his life, all his life, potentially. Um, and he was sharing meals with others and even they had group cooking and there was not really a vegetarian option. <laughs> now he could have perhaps asserted a vegetarian option and said, I really want to eat this certain specific way, but he just decided to join in the retreat and he questioned the thought, I am a vegetarian. Is that true? And he just, um, you know, ate fish and ate cheese and might have eaten cheese already. But the idea being, um, it reminded me of the movie The Life of Pi. Remember that movie? Um, sweet and based on an absolutely true story where um, a young man from India gets caught in a huge storm and is one of the only surviving people from that boat in a small little tiny lifeboat for many weeks out at sea. And he lives, even though he is starving and incredibly thirsty, until his boat is swept onto an island. Really remarkable story. And the reason he lives, he's able to acquire food and drink, is because it rains into the boat and he has water, fresh water to drink. And there's a huge storm and all these fish gets swept right into his little tiny boat and he eats them raw. And he's been a vegetarian his entire life. He's from a place in India where everybody's vegetarian and you really, you just do not eat animals. But he does that during the time that he's out at sea in order to live. Now, I'm not saying anybody should question. It is absolutely tremendous and beautiful to be, to eat as you do, vegetarian. Uh, or vegan, or raw food, or whatever your lifetime of a way to eat, what works for you. 
like a, as long as it's a, like a lifetime experience that you could live with for the rest of your life. And there are plans and orientations around that or ideas around that based on maybe a deep philosophy or a deep sense of what works for you that's really trusting. Wonderful. I think um, a clue with wondering if you wonder what to eat or what you're going to be served or if you're going to be okay is just noticing I'm carrying an eating peace orientation that will be with me for my entire life. I'm not on a temporary diet plan. I'm not starving myself right now or stuffing myself because I'm going to starve myself later or any of that kind of diet mentality, kind of restriction, overdoing it mentality or lack of safety. So if you are traveling, which this time of year so many people do, and here I go off to traveling, I love this sense of trusting that they are going to be offering beautiful foods and a variety of them. I already know that's true when I go to Brighton Bush. When anyone comes to the Eating Peace Retreat, that is true and infinitely true because we're in a city on purpose so that nearby there's all different kinds of things offered to eat and people can test them out and experiment with it, bring them back for our mindful eating practice. And it's just an amazing way to be with food and eating and what's available instead of overwhelmed by it all. So I love having the sense of that I can trust this body. I can trust myself to stop when I'm full. The ultimate thing that I need as a structure in my life when it comes to food and eating is my sense of fullness and my sense of hunger. It is given to me from birth. Even if you feel like, oh my God, I don't know when I'm hungry. I don't know when I'm full. That is a great thing to question. Is it true that you don't know? Are you absolutely sure? Can we get in touch with the much more subtle sensations of hunger and fullness? And it goes with you everywhere and you don't need your head. You really don't. In fact, I do, I do acknowledge that we need to undo some thinking that's in our minds. Panic and fear about not having enough. Sometimes when you've dieted a lot, you don't trust yourself much. You know, it kind of emphasizes and underscores you are not to be trusted. And so you need to have a plan with your mind about what food's going to be available to you and you need to make sure it's available. But, you know, this is not, it, you, can, you can understand that if you have some really special, like I, there's a young child that I know that has severe allergies. And of course, there's going to be some structure offered. If that family travels, they're going to bring some, probably some foods to make sure he's covered and he's okay, just in case what's around them and what's available is uncertain because he could die with several different things if they enter his system. It's a matter of life or death. But they work with it. It's okay. So there's that kind of structure. But we're talking about being able to trust the world and trust um, the cooking. I can absolutely trust it with Brighton Bush. And there's trustworthy places that are offering food. And I know there's places that you can think, oh my gosh, evil, suspicious. <laughs> Maybe that's a little strong. You can question, you know, if that is actually true. And I notice there's many foods that I once didn't know about were so were so difficult, you know, with, with so many additives and all that. And I just kind of tend to move away from them and find other things that are more delicious. So just the sense of trust that you can carry your body with you and without emotional eating with inquiry you can address the things you feel like you crave and you desire and ask yourself what else you need besides food if you feel like you want to eat when you're not hungry there's probably some unfulfilled need within you that you're afraid won't get met and you can ask yourself what it is it is so such a relief to get that need fulfilled by just asking yourself, you put your hand on your heart and your other hand on your stomach and just say, what do you need right now, honey? 
I hear that you're hungry and you think something sweet or something extra or a snack or something is going to settle you down. And what else is it that you really need? Am I believing a thought that's bringing out a lack of trust for what's going on in the world? Am I scared about something? Do I feel worried about something, anxious? And it's something else often that has nothing to do with food. So just being able to trust and take care of yourself as you need to, if you are moving from here to there, going for a visit someplace, taking your body from here to there on an airplane, in a car, going someplace new and unusual, feeling slowness inside so that you can be in touch with your body, just asking your body, asking your body, getting a feel of it, a feel of it. What do I need right now when it comes to food and eating? And that there often as we begin to do that, it becomes more and more willing to communicate with you and easy. So I know that I can just take this thing called a body that has this mind attached to it <laughs> and I can go off someplace and other people will be cooking and serving and I am perfectly safe, perfectly content, enjoying what's available to me there. Safe, safe, trusting, all is well. If something happens and I miss a meal, I will take care of myself, just like a mother take care of their little baby. Treat your food and hunger, your stomach, like it's a little baby. All right, let me know how it goes. And if you desire, come to retreat with me in Seattle next month. We have a most amazing time. We start on a Wednesday night and go all the way to Monday morning. But it gives us time to really sit and practice, be with it, understand, take our thinking to inquiry. Magnificent. All right. Take care. <laughs>